Hi, uh, so I'm Sam. I'm from Dalston, Wisconsin. Quick show of hands, how many people are from Dalston, Wisconsin? Right, so that's a problem with extra specific questions. Uh, so yeah, uh, you know, work at a Laughlin Constable and uh, I do have a habit of walking around. So if I do fall, it's not my fault. But uh, we work uh, with different clients and our job is to help them try out stuff. So every now and then we come up with something that is interesting, which is why I'm talking to cranberries and pests, and why an advertising agency, excuse me, is trying to help them with pest management. All right, so cranberries, the what and the who and the bugs. So cranberry farming. So. Until I started working with this client, I had no idea about cranberries, all right? The only thing I knew about cranberries was it's great with a drink, it's awesome in Thanksgiving, and that's about it. I thought cranberries grew on trees. It seems they don't. They actually grow in little tiny bushes, all right? And a cool fact, you know, when you've seen the advertisements of ocean spray with people standing in a bog and, you know, trying to be funny, well, there's a reason why cranberries are flooded, right? They have a tiny pocket of air in the berry itself. So when you flood the bogs, they float up. So that's pretty cool, I don't know about that. So it's native to Northeastern uh, America. All right, it's the number one fruit crop uh, for Wisconsin. A billion dollars in value, and uh, Wisconsin produces around half the world's supply. You know, and it employs around 4,000 people in the state, so it is a sizable industry, right? It has an, a real impact. Now, this might help to understand the scope of the problem, right? So, it's a thought exercise, all right, and feel free to indulge in it. So I would say close your eyes, imagine a nice warm summer day. A oh, tough crowd, all right. <laughs> Give it a shot, all right, it's a nice warm summer day, and you have this beautiful cocktail, all right, a nice, nice cosmopolitan, all right. Beautiful vodka, it's got some splash of cranberry juice, it's awesome, all right. And you open your eyes, and this is a new drink. So obviously, this is a huge problem. I mean, I wouldn't be able to you know, handle that. So little did I realize, and actually us, that these are the kind of problems that farmers face, right? Is that you have a multitude of pests that people have to respond to in near real time because it has a direct impact on crop yields, right? It has a direct impact on world food supply. So it is a sizable problem. So just a little bit, you know. You're probably going to see more pictures of bugs than you're comfortable with, uh, so, but it's a good thing, right? So you've got the black-headed fireworm, all right, and the cranberry fruit worm. So those two are the most important bugs, and it's hard for even an experienced farmer in the field when, they, when they're taking a look at it to actually recognize, to, to, to distinguish between them. So the current solution is that uh, they actually take a sample, all right, and they send it off to a field station, and the typical turnaround time is two weeks. Now, when you are a farmer and your, you know, your, your crop right, is dependent on the timely application of pesticides when there's a, a, a bug outbreak, you know, it becomes really important to be able to get those results back. Right? So, and, and even if it doesn't you know, bloom into a full-blown problem, right, it's a peace of mind that's also important. Right? So when you're designing solutions, you know, it's always good to think about the end user, right? Like, AI is great, all right? So is a lot of different technology. But you really have to consider from, from the fact that, you know, who are you building this for, right? And for us, we had a bunch of people that sometimes technology leaves behind, you know, because uh, on a tangent. So I went up north uh, to, they have a cranberry school, right? And it's a big collection of farmers who come there, and they're really cool people, really engaged. And I stuck out of the sore thumb, right? So I walk up there, the tractors in the convention, right? And, and I walk up and I talk about the application technology in what they do, all right? These are down-to-earth people, all right, who oftentimes are downstream from developments that happen in the rest of the world. I mean, in the West Coast, most of the advances are being built here, all right? But up there, you know, it's not that often that somebody takes the time to actually think about, you know, what does it mean on a daily, you know, on a daily basis, right, uh, to be a farmer, to produce these crops that, all we do is, at the end of it, consume it. So in any case, as I said, it was a tangent, lost my train of thought, but uh, you know, we're very excited about you know, the possibility of providing a solution that can you know, help them in the field. 
And it started off with a weird conversation. So we do public relations for the Wisconsin Cranberry Growers Association. And the PR person had a conversation with the cranberry growers, and they came up to us and said, listen, can you help identify bugs in the field, right? And this is around two years ago the first conversation happened. And two years ago, you're like, yeah, that's a problem, right? We may not be able to help. We don't have any data. There's nothing out there, right? And, you know, TensorFlow came out, and you're like, okay, this might be some possibility. And at that time, none of us in the agency had any experience with TensorFlow or most of the uh, deep learning or even machine learning techniques. So this is where we dive into the overall architecture. As I mentioned, right, when they came with the conversation, the first thing that any decent data scientist is going to ask is, like, do you have any data, right? And they had zero. That was the issue. So there are no images of bugs at all, right? We did a Google search, and we found a few that could be useful, but the problem was that we didn't have any images of bugs in the field itself, right? So let's consider the problem, right? We have to develop an app that can help farmers in the field identify a bug, all right, using images that don't exist, all right? And the only time we can collect data is during the growing season, which is around three months. So, and this is not funded. So it is interesting convincing the agency to say, you know what? We really like this, all right, and we have no idea if this is going to make any money. In fact, it's probably not going to make us any money, but let's do it, right? And uh, a little bit of arm twisting later, they said, you know, go for it. So this is where the architecture comes in, all right? It's relatively simple, all right? And, you know, we started off with, you know, let's get something to work first, all right? And before we start tightening down the hatches, all right? So we have, you know, different kinds of users. You know, a general user is essentially a farmer walking around. He sees a bug, takes, you know, picks of the bug in his hand on a net, takes a picture, it uploads it, all right? We have a subject matter expert. These are actually researchers of Ocean Spray. So the cool thing is Ocean Spray got really interested, all right, and they have researchers there uh, who volunteered their time, all right? And this is where the, the role of partnerships become really important, right? Because if we had to go out in the field, collect the data, all right, and we had to train ourselves up to become subject matter experts, this would have been doomed to failure. So this was actual outreach saying that, hey, we have this interesting problem, all right, we may not be able to solve it, but, you know, uh, we could really appreciate some help out here. And they were on board, and they're actually, in their free time, they actually go and label images for us. And we have the admin, which unfortunately is me and a couple of other people at the uh, agency, so uh, it's, uh, the, the scope of the admin is kind of broad because we can just go into the machine and change things, which is a bad thing. And of course, we did everything on Azure because that's one of the things that, uh, that's one of the sort of cloud providers that we work with. In hindsight, we could have used something else that could make our lives a little easier, but you know, we went with Azure. And you know, the interface layer, and oh yeah, all the uh, functionality is exposed through a custom mobile app right now, it's iOS, and we are building out an Android application as well. But uh, so yeah, uh, there's this, uh, it's a microservice layer, there's a bunch of Azure functions, right? So it makes it cheaper, it's more scalable, and it's very specific, right? So something like, you know, imagine a function that does register device, or register user, right? Or upload image. So everything's very granular that way, right? There is no dependency on each other, right? And we use two different kinds of storages for this. A table storage for managing stuff, right? So for instance, a user and the device and stuff like that. And we use blob storage for the images themselves, right? And uh, there's a VM that we have on Azure that, you know, that uses Flask, right? So we expose the TensorFlow model using Flask, right? So a request comes in. Uh, essentially, we uh, give it a blob ID, all right? So in Azure, you know, you can identify a blob using an ID, which makes it useful. And then uh, we can download the blob and pump it to the TensorFlow model, come up with the classification, return the results out. And the, uh, the stuff that we have on-prem is essentially our developer's workstation. So, as I said, this is bootstrapped up, right? There are better ways of doing it, but what we do is we download the data, we train it, all right? We see if it meets at least the metrics of the previous model. If it does or exceeds it, we upload it. If not, we go back to the drawing board. And the application is really simple. You know, there's a registration screen and essentially a way to upload images, all right? And that is from my phone. So I didn't actually go to the field to take a picture of the bug, so there's only one image. That is my test saying that, hey, does it work? Data collection, right? So as you can see, that is how 
they find the bugs, right? They take a picture of it. So this is actually a live sample. This is collected by I don't know who, but somebody collected it. We have 11 growers, gatherers, right? Uh, and they essentially, they go out in the field, and every now and then they stop, they pick up a bug, all right, either in a net or in their hand, and uh, they take a picture. It gets uploaded. If they have network connectivity issues, we upload it when they have sort of more bandwidth, all right? So we don't lose the pictures. And the other thing is that because it's only an iOS application, so obviously there is limitation in terms of our user base, all right? So what we've encouraged people to do is just take a picture. We'll figure out how to get the pictures in later, right? But just take the picture, because right now, you know, for 11 grows out there, right, you have a whole bunch of other people who are actually in the field who don't have access to the application. So instead of wasting that opportunity, let's just take it, and we'll figure out a way to get it in later, all right? And so far, we, uh, we've managed to get more than 100 images per class, all right? There are five classes of insects, all right? The two ones that I know are the black-headed worm and the cranberry fruit worm. There are three other uh, classes as well, all right? And uh, so when the image is uploaded, it, uh, you know, not only do we store it in blob storage, we also attempt a classification, right? So we come back with the results set, and uh, the advantage of that is that we are also allowing subject matter experts to you know, label them as miscategorized or not. So we are allowing this to be sort of a, a complete cycle. So not only are you collecting images as you're going about, we're trying to help you classify the images as you're doing it, and we're further collecting our data set. So you know, at the end of this growing cycle, we probably will have enough images to make a robust application, and hopefully by next year, it's going to be uh, a lot more accurate. Labeling, you know, as I said, we have subject matter experts, all right, and Ocean Spray is a whole bunch of really cool people, you know, and uh, they are helping us classify these things because when we first started classifying them, we called them green bug, blue bug, uh, black bug, and it was not completely accurate. The, one of the next steps is that we want to integrate uh, labeling in the application itself, all right? Right now, it's a manual process, so the, <laughs> the way we do it right now is the way actually they do it right now is they have a bunch of folders that signify what kind of bug they're classifying. They take the images and dump them in the folders, right? And we just, uh, you know, sort of parse the folder structure and use that as the labels. You know, results so far, right? We have, you know, 11 participants. You know, the data gathering period started in early April. Uh, initial results are around 85% accuracy for us. So that is the proof of the pudding, right? Is that is it more accurate than, say, a layperson? So let's say I gave you a bunch of images, right, and told you that this is a green bug and a blue bug and a black bug, right? And, and I ask you, you know, so you take a look at it, and a day later, right, I ask you to come back and I give you a few more images and I ask you to classify them, right? Now, if this can outperform that, all right, for us that's a good starting point to say that, you know what, there, there might be legs out here. And, and the reason is you can always ask, you know, uh, why the next day? Well, the reason is this, right? You're a farmer, you're going in the field, all right? You're not going to be carrying out these punch cards with you, all right, which allow you to see what bugs are there. So it, it's based on recollection. So we want to take that cognitive load away from the farmer and just allow them to focus on stuff that they are interested in. Oh, maybe I should talk about the uh, model as well. One second. So if you notice out here in the virtual machine, uh, in the VM, we have Flask and uh, a TensorFlow instance. So we did something that pretty much anybody who's encountered the hot dog, not hot dog app, all right, does is we take a transfer learning model, all right, and we base it on Inception version three, all right, and it made lives a lot easier. And that, that's another thing I, I did want to talk about is that. So we have encountered a lot of clients who are interested in using artificial intelligence, all right? And there's always a stumbling block, both internally in terms of the business side and the development side. On the business side, people are nervous about, hey, first of all, you know, we're not, this is a very familiar refrain that, hey, we're not Google, right? We're not Amazon, right? Do we actually need artificial intelligence, right? And it, it becomes an educational problem, right? But also on the engineering side, and I'm more passionate on the engineering side because I deal with a bunch of engineers, is that they come back to the same things. They say, hey, we're not Google, we're not Amazon, right? Where do we start? And so before even they attempt to solve a problem, they kind of give up. And the biggest reason for this is this, right? They see a nice little research paper come out, and they say, you know, we're never going to make our own convolutional neural network, right? We're never going to come up with our own model, right? And it's almost as if suddenly AI is a field where if you don't make that thing from scratch, you're not good enough. 
And my counter-argument to that is this, right? Is that a lot of you, if you're developers, have used sorting functions, right? So you maybe use quick sort, or maybe use merge sort. But I can pretty much guarantee none of you came up with that algorithm yourself. It's always been there. And you don't give it a second moment sort. So when it's OK for a traditional problem domain to use other people's tools, suddenly there's a disconnect that in AI, unless you're actually making these tools, you're not good enough, right? And so people don't even try. And the, and the problem with that is this, right? Is that it stops innovation, right? It stops people from, again, trying to understand why are these tools there? Like, who are you building this for? You know, I'm not going to build a CNN by myself, all right? I might muck around with it. I might you know, fine tune some parameters, all right? But that's not my goal. My goal is to help solve, you know, farmers out there with problems that they face in their daily lives, all right? And this is, what, you know, when I, asked you, when I asked the first question, how many people are from Dallas, Wisconsin, all right? So that was kind of a tongue in cheek question. The reason I asked you this, is that it's very easy to tell, and I've been in this conference for two days now, all right, is that the number of people from the Midwest is not as much as people, say, from the West Coast or, say, uh, from New York or Boston. And that's an issue, is that there are a lot of businesses out there who have these unmet needs, and they don't have the talent pool to help solve them. And the reason they don't have the talent pool is, that, is the same reason, is that it's, it's a vicious cycle. And when we started off, you know, we had no idea how this could be done, right? There's none of the infrastructure. It is not funded. And we work in an agency where, let's face it, I'm a billable resource. <laughs> if I come back and say, can I put in, uh, excuse me, can I put in 20% of my time towards a pro bono project, I'm going to get some really stern looks, especially by the guy sitting right there. Uh, he's my colleague, all right? So it, 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 it becomes a vicious cycle where, the innovation is really downstream, right? And uh, sometimes all you got to do is just get up and try. So the people involved, right? So we had three engineers from, uh, from Laughlin Constant, you know, two backhand, right? So one was more on the Azure Functions side, uh, C Sharp, you know, traditional .NET, right? Uh, one was more Python, that was essentially me helping out with the Flask integration and training the model. Uh, there was one mobile developer using Objective-C, all right, one account executive from LC, no pointing fingers. Uh, one active researcher at Ocean Spray, and three more on a volunteer basis, and 10 growers are participating. Right? And now, uh, the Wisconsin Cranberry State Cranberry Growers Association, they have around 200 growers. All right? And again, there are 4,000 people employed in this industry. So we are planning to actually uh, you know, open up access to pretty much all of them. And again, uh, we have no way of knowing if you're going to make any money off it, because you probably aren't. Uh, but that was not the goal of this project in the first place. And, you know, amount of data science, machine learning experience prior to application, it's a frowny face. I couldn't figure out a number, all right? So that was essentially the first conversation that we had internally, like, oh, can you guys actually do it? And we all looked around and said, probably not, but we're going to do it. Then, so there are three smiley faces at the end of it, all right? It's indicating that, you know, we, we have grown. So it's going to take time. We're building out our teams. We're building out our capabilities. And we're taking on more and more projects. A side benefit of this project is we've actually taken on and helping out more clients in adopting some of these things that they always thought were out of reach for them. You know? So that's a cool side benefit. Future, near term. So opening up access to the application. All right? We're going to use TensorFlow serving because Flask and model is a little uh, <laughs> brittle. You know, expansion and app scope, we're going to start integrating weather data, right? So that's another interesting thing. What happens when a bug shows up before it's supposed to show up, or what happens if it shows up after, right? What, what does that signal look like? What does that mean for a grower, right? Uh, the really cool part is, uh, so the growers decided to apply for a, so a lot of acronyms here. I'm not even sure what the acronyms actually mean, all right? All we know is we got an email saying that they applied for a grant for the application, and uh, it's got uh, initial approval, and they have included it into a USDA specialty crop block grant for funding. Again, not sure what it meant, but we all are high-fiving after that. Like, awesome. How much money? Well, it's not that much. Well, that's not the point, all right? It's really cool that an application that started off from a chance conversation has now parts of the government interested in seeing you know, where can this go, and that is really, really cool, all right? So another acronym, DATCP, all that stuff, all right? Uh, so we're going to find out about this in fall, 
All right, and uh, that's kind of where we're at right now. And the other aspects of this application is we're gonna start branching out into diseases as well. So one part of cranberry growing is that, yes, you have pests, right? But you also have diseases. For instance, you know, your leaves might, you know, contract some kind of blight. So is it possible to use the application to say, okay, this is a problem versus not a problem? So the scope is expanding slowly but surely. And now we have active participants, because now we have the growers coming back to us and saying, hey, wouldn't it be great if the application could do that? And for me, that's really awesome, because Again, a community that was not that tech forward, all right, only because they haven't been engaged before, are coming up with some really cool ideas that we never considered. And the other aspect is we are going to go in the field over the summer to actually follow them around because what this is really missing is the user experience. Like, you know, again, when I started talking about this, I talked about what does it mean to be a farmer, right? And from where I sit, I have zero understanding of it. So we're actually going to go in. All the engineers are going to go in. We're going to take our apps with us and we're gonna walk around following them around, so we get, it's the cliche term, right? Empathy, all right? Now, it's, you know, how do, we, how do we let empathy allow us to develop a better application? As I end, be nice to your toaster. Uh, there's a backstory to this. I am committed to using this as my last slide for every presentation, all right? I have no idea why this particular slide, but I'm committed to using this on every presentation. But that's all I have. You know, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask me or, you know, find me after the present here. Hey, first of all, awesome. Second, did you think about doing this open source? Because you mentioned you have three developers. That's mm -hmm. not much. There are a lot of developers in this room, and I'm sure there are a lot of developers in, like, a lot in wide, wild world, and I'm sure some of them would like to help, and uh, yeah. Uh, you know, so there's parts of it that we can open source. It's, it's a great question, by the way, right? I do want more people to get involved in this, right? Because it's not just cranberries, there's a whole bunch of growing communities that we can help out. You know, the, the sticky point becomes who owns the data, right? So the, the engineering aspects itself, that we can open source any time because we're using open source tools. There's nothing really that specific to what we're doing, right? Now, for instance, th there is an aspect where this application is getting hung up. So there are two kinds of bugs that it just can't distinguish well. So now we're trying to use uh, an SVM on top of a classification layer, right? Which is an, a nice, a neat little experiment, and we don't know if that's gonna work or not. So now that becomes really specific to the application. So that is gonna be harder for us to open source, right? But the rest of it is actually, it's really simple. It's a data gathering tool, a way to label the data, right? So that kind of stuff we can open source any time. And frankly, the only reason we haven't yet is that we just didn't have the time to think through the other possibilities. So in the future, yeah, we are gonna open it up. Thank you. All right, we actually do have a few minutes for more questions if anybody has any. So, you, you mentioned at the very tail end of it that you're going to follow around the farmers or who, the individuals with your own apps. I mean, obviously, there's a lot more data that you could collect than just images. Mm -hmm. Are you, is that the whole plan, is that you're going to be doing, like, GPS? That is the whole plan. And, like, so samples of the actual water that they're in or found within or the, you know, different content of the cranberries the bug was eating or something like that? No, that's actually a really good question. So, you know, as I mentioned in passing, we're gonna start incorporating weather data, right? Now, we are also using the location data on the cell phone to figure out, you know, what weather data is pertinent to that particular location. But the grand scheme is actually using more IoT-enabled devices in the field so that we can have more real-time monitoring. So the data streams is gonna start increasing, right? Uh, for us, our biggest thing is that we need people to start using the app first, and then we, let's start collecting what other peripheral information can we collect. But the, the overall vision is that having sensors in place in the fields, right? That is gonna be crucial going forward. Uh, you know, drone imagery, can that be helpful in some way? Now we found services that you know, can literally fly a drone out there and take some aerial photography. Now, is, would, would that be pertinent? So we, now we're starting to expand the scope of the kinds of data that we are gonna collect, right? And uh, for the most part, we have no idea if it's pertinent or not, or how do we use that data, all right? But that's a problem we can figure out over time. But to answer your question, yes. 
All right, any other questions? Okay, uh, how about a round of applause? <laughs>